I want to talk now about how you worked within the studio system, how you worked with the various departments, and how you got along with them, and, and how you worked with them on a picture. When you got ready to do a picture, when you saw the writer's first draft or whatever it was of the script, uh, then how did it develop in your relationships with the various production departments and, and everything like that? Well, you see, uh, 20th is a, is a wonderfully well-organized uh, company. I mean, it's a wonderful, well-organized, and they have wonderful departments. The departments are marvelous. Now, you must understand, when a script comes out, it's mimeographed. Mm -hmm. And that may be that it may be a first draft, second draft, maybe a final draft. Yeah. But when that final draft goes through and it's mimeographed and it's put on the schedule for production, the head of the art department gets a copy of that, or maybe two copies of it. The wardrobe department gets a copy of that. Men's wardrobe and ladies' wardrobe gets a copy of it. The transportation department gets a copy of it. The, uh, the, uh, the construction, they get a copy of it. Everybody, every department head gets a copy of this, and he reads it. All right, now, <coughs> you have a long room that's the shape of this with a long table across the end here. And uh, the director sits in the middle here, and he has his assistant sit over here, and you have a studio executive sit over here. I mean, the man representing the studio production end sitting over <laughs> here. And then um, somebody here. Now, now all through here are department heads. <laughs> now, they have worked out what, we'll say transportation wants to ask you so many questions. So now you have to sit here and transportation says, I know on such and such a location you're going to have, uh, how many people you're going to have, and are these people going to be housed there, or where you're going to house them, and so forth, because he's got to figure what kind of transportation you're going to have for that back in here. Mm -hmm. The animal man over here is, how many horses are you going to use on so and so and so and so? How many automobiles are you going to have such, or what's going to be? Mm -hmm. All right, the wardrobe, has has a budget made out on so many habits and you're going to change the clothes on such and such and such and such and such a time all right now we we figure in this there are 14 sequences there'll be 14 changes of costume and then you say but i don't think we can double back on a costume from here to here i mean you know being very consistent mm -hmm. and then the men's costume will do the same thing all right, well, now you sit and you answer all the questions that they have in here. Mm -hmm. The assistant director has had this, what you call a breakdown sheet. Mm -hmm. And it says on page so and so and such and such and it tells them and gives you an idea of what's going to be in it. It mm -hmm. tells you what, what's going to comprise them. Well, they all have that. They turn to that. Then they ask you the questions about that. And you go on through it. Now, all right, now from this, they go and each one makes up a budget. Then you add all that budget together, then the headache starts. <laughs> but uh, you see, uh, in these days, we were the only picture that I ever went up into five million dollars on was Wilson. Mm -hmm. And Wilson was a, was a tremendously big and a very yeah. elaborate picture, which we did a lot of it in Washington, and we did, did we worked all over with it. It was a very elaborate, even today. The only thing against Wilson was the title. If it had been called something else, it would have been a tremendous success, because it was, I, I consider Wilson one of the best pictures that I ever made in my life. And uh, it finally paid out, you know, but just paid out. Made, maybe made 6% on its money or something like that, mm -hmm. you see, through television and all that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. But uh, in that way, there's a good working agreement between you and all the different departments. Mm -hmm. And if you uh, handle yourself right, all the departments are for you. If you're not complaining about their department, if you, they make a mistake, you tell them so. Mm -hmm. And uh, if it's your mistake, well, you admit it. I was wrong in this, and go and go on, just like any other human being. That's all it is, because no one's infallible. But uh, I never had the slightest bit of trouble. I mean, with any any of the departments or anything mm -hmm. like that. And 
have been always able to get whatever I wanted, but I have always tried to uh, say that my wants were not unreasonable. Mm -hmm. <coughs> now, we had, uh, we had a scene, for instance, uh, we were in Arizona down near Nogales uh, on uh, David Bathsheba. And, uh, of course, the cameraman is your, is your right arm. The cameraman is out to work with you. Or, uh, if you. The cameraman, the director, if they can't work together, they might just as well get out of the country. Because uh, it's uh, uh, all, the only thing you're going to get is going to be bad. And uh, I wanted an effect of where David made that trek up to Gilboa, the island, you know, where uh, the, the, the big battle was fought, you know, and where the king was killed all that. Um, I wanted to do that, and I wanted to do it in daytime. And the studio wanted to build an artificial rock in the studio, and one of the coach came and I said, it doesn't look like a rock to me. And over in Arizona, I found a cliff that where these people could have had their backs to the wall, as they explained. I found a cliff that was in there, and it sloped up, and it was pictorial as it could be. And it was natural, and it was real rock. And I had many scenes, I mean, to do there. So, but I wanted to do it at night. So, <clears throat> Leon Shamroy and I went out to this location, and I mean, at six o'clock at night, seven o'clock at night, it was no good. We went out at five o'clock in the morning, five thirty in the morning, at six in the morning, and at six in the morning, the sun was just coming over the top of the hill, mm -hmm. and. Uh, and Leon, of course, is my estimation, one of the greatest cameramen that's ever been. Uh, we took a shot shooting into the sun. Well, now, color, if you shoot backlight with color and put no fill light in it, it makes the most beautiful silhouette in the world. Mm -hmm. It's the yeah. most beautiful silhouette. Well, we photographed the pet coming up like that, and he came up into a big close-up like this. Well, I stayed with him. And uh, finally, we had to cross the sun. We knew that was that. We took a little tree that was about that big around and planted it right here. And came up this way, and when we did the pam, we did the pam on that little tree. It was close. It was that close to the lens. You see, it just mm -hmm. you just shoot through that, and it was just pam like that, and let him him go on. Well, we actually photographed that at quarter to six in the morning. Mm -hmm. And, uh, but you see, there are many people, these people that say, well, I wouldn't get up that early, I wouldn't do that or anything, but you see with Peck, he's the type of a guy that he's just interested in making a good picture, that's all. He just wants the picture to be good, and he'll mm -hmm. give everything that he has for yeah. that, for that to be good. Mm -hmm. Well, Shamroy's the same way, yeah. and I'm the same way, that what we're trying to make that the best that it can possibly be. And uh, they're, they're, you can't be lazy and make mm -hmm. good pictures. I know you fly your own plane and, and look for locations. Uh, why specifically do you like to go out and, uh, and use locations even on uh, pictures that might not necessarily call for them, like Jesse James, for example, which could have been done here but wasn't, obviously? Well, now, and you're speaking of Jesse James, you say it could have been done here. You can do any picture, any place. Mm -hmm. But is, uh, if you had a big formal occasion, we'll say at the Beverly Hilton Hotel, and everything was white tie and tails, and the two of us walked in dressed the way we are, would we look out of place or would we look yeah. real or what? Well, now, that's exactly the way I feel mm -hmm. about a location. Now, uh, when you go back to the days of Jesse James, and, I mean, you're bringing this up. Mm -hmm. uh, going back to the days of Jesse James, you have to think in the period of Jesse James, of just at the end of the Civil War. Mm -hmm. And uh, they had the old rail fences, the old snake fences, mm -hmm. and these snake fences are all grown up with different kinds of sprouts and uh, um, elder bush and all of these different things. Well, now, 
the reason I went to Missouri, well, there were many, many reasons. The first thing, uh, when Nunley Johnson had finished the screenplay, I flew down to Kansas City and got a car and drove out to Kearney and to the, to the Jesse James home where he was raised. And uh, his Frank James son was a retired lawyer who was living there. And the monument of Jesse James, where he was buried in the corner of the yard, started out as a, one of those little, what do you call it, sort of peaks like that, you know. Mm, yeah. uh, it, was, it was about almost as high as this room, but the tourists had chipped it down. Everybody dug mm. the chip off of it until it was about this high. Mm. Well, I sat under the tree by that grave talking to, the, uh, to his nephew. Getting information and him showing me the guns and showing me where the bomb was thrown through the house and all of these things. And I got first-hand information that, uh, no, that was not available. And I brought all this back to Nunley Johnson. And Nunley was so delighted with it that he made a, quite a number of changes by putting these things, even though he knew I was going to use them that way, but Nunley is one of the most accommodating and, and one of the best and most perfect Finnish writers that I know of. Mm -hmm. He incorporated all these things into the story. Mm -hmm. Now, in talking with this man, I got the feeling of the period. A friend of mine, who was the vice president of the Phillips Petroleum Company, mm -hmm. had told me about Pineville, Missouri. Mm -hmm. And uh, when I did my preliminary work on the screenplay, I mean, now even as well as Nunley Johnson writes and all like that, I took the screenplay and went to Florida and spent two weeks in isolation. Uh, just working the little things that I wanted to do with this and that to, you know, to, uh, mm -hmm. I mean, for economy's sake, for one thing. In other mm -hmm. words, uh, to try to build one of these fences out here would have cost a fortune. And then it mm -hmm. would have looked like a phony. Mm -hmm. It would not have looked like what it was at all. Yeah. To build the houses that we used back there out here would have been, they would have been motion picture sets mm -hmm. and there's nothing around them would have matched with them. But you see, the entire area has got to have a feeling about it. So then I had Bob Webb meet me at uh, Pineville, meet me at uh, Bartlesville, Missouri, mm -hmm. out of Oklahoma. And then we drove over to Pineville, Missouri. Mm -hmm. And we covered every side road, every little creek. We covered everything. Well, I laid out there exactly where I would shoot this, where I would shoot that, where I would do this. Mm -hmm. Well, now you had some expanse. I mean, you were not you were not having to shoot in a little corner right here. Everything mm -hmm. just summed up so you all you'd make is a TV close up. Yeah. You had the whole world behind you, and all of it was in you know was in character. Mm -hmm. I mean, the trees, huh? You take, uh, in that country, a, a, a field that has been what they call new land, where they've gone through and cut off from the stumps from this high, mm -hmm. and it's planted in some kind of grass or wheat or whatever it may be, and they mow it with the, with the you know, the hand uh, scythe and a, mm -hmm. you know, a reaper, they call it. And, uh, I mean, it, it's something that, this country at Pineville was like Kearney, and that period was at the time of Jesse James. Mm -hmm. And you were not limited to having telephone poles in your way. You weren't mm -hmm. limited to anything. And uh, in the town of Pineville, here was a church. I mean, here was a courthouse that was built prior to the Civil War, that was still mm -hmm. standing, was still acting. Mm -hmm. And when Bob Webb and I drove into the town and we wanted to see the mayor, and they said, the mayor is over there cutting the courthouse lawn. <laughs> <laughs> so we, we uh, went over and uh, met the gentleman and uh, we made arrangements with him and he got the city council together and we had, uh, they were going to take us to dinner and I said, no, we'll take you to dinner. I said, I want to do the talking. <laughs> and uh, we went to the cave restaurant 
And uh, there I explained to them, I said, this is no small operation. I said, when they, we move in here, you're going to think Ringling Brothers' three-ring circus is coming. With so many trucks, so many people, is all this. Where are you going? Somebody wrote up and said, where are you going to house all these people? I said, that's also going to be a problem. We we're going to ask a lot of help on that matter. We rented every house. The people moved out of the houses in the house that Tyrone Power lived in. And uh, uh, Brian Don Levy, I think, and Tyrone Power lived in the same house. And people moved out and gave them the house mm. and put a cookie in there. I had a house. And all this that we had it was there was not hotel facilities. That was in a little town of Noah, just near there. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's uh, another thing I'll say. For instance, when I did David and Bathsheba, I'll jump off of it. Uh, yeah. okay. When I David David and Bathsheba, here I had to have a country that was biblical country. Mm -hmm. I had chariots tearing across through the open country. Mm -hmm. I had uh, all these marches up. I had the city of Jerusalem. I had all this. I couldn't just have the walls of Jerusalem here and telegraph poles sticking <laughs> up and, and antennas and mm -hmm. TV antennas on the background. Mm -hmm. So I found a spot back of Nogales, Arizona where you could go out and you were free and you had the world behind you. And I had, for instance, the time that when David came into Jerusalem, uh, mm -hmm. uh, where uh, John, John, what's his name, uh, I, I met him. Well, I had a shot of this, uh, this chariot coming down the hill around the road like this, right up close to the camera. Mm -hmm. And of course, we only had 11 camels. So I put the 11 camels in here, and we pan by the 11 camels that way. Now when I cut down, I put the 11 camels on the other side. So we, we multiplied these camels until we had, uh, we were in the time that that was the principal means of transportation. You couldn't just have one camel. So uh, by the time we got through with these camels, we had 150 camels in the picture, you see. But, uh, that is one of the great interesting things about picture making. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, there's some of these uh, people of today that get in and they would want 150 camels. Well, it'd be fine if you have to put them all single file. Well, if you want to do that, go to Egypt or go to North Africa where they have the camels in abundance. Well, then do that. But I couldn't take them. You couldn't do David and Bathsheba over there. Mm -hmm. uh, you couldn't take the cast and take all this and go there, and you can't go there with the second unit and shoot anything. Mm -hmm. So I had everything here, and it looked like biblical, biblical country. You mentioned these new managements coming in. Uh, how did this affect what you did or, or did it? As what? How did the, the new managements affect the work you did or what... Uh, what kind of decisions did you have to get from them? Did you get decisions from them easily, or were they difficult about it, or...? No, I'll tell you, I have always been this way, that if I go out to make a picture, I assume that obligation and go on and make the picture. And I'm not disturbed about whether you're the manager or somebody else is the manager or someone else is the manager. I'm not... Uh, that is a, managing a studio or running a company is one thing entirely. The moment that that assignment comes over to me to do the picture, I assume the responsibility of that mm -hmm. and go ahead with it. And uh, that was one of the things that made me uh, feel, I have such a great feeling uh, for Daryl Zanuck. Mm -hmm. uh, Daryl Zanuck is a man who can make decisions, but he's always listening. Mm -hmm. He never, he Here's a man that can hear more and listen and be more intent on listening and hearing and get more information than he can by talking. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, he gives you the assignment to do a picture, and uh, he will write you love notes every day. It says, saw the rushes, they're great. Saw the rushes, they're wonderful. Saw the rushes, they're great. Mm -hmm. 
I thought the scene that so-and-so did today was tremendous. He's always giving you that little, that little urge, I mean, to go on. At the same time, if he sees something that he's concerned about or doesn't understand, he said, writes a little note. He said, would you stop by the office on your way in tonight? You go in. He said, you know, uh, that scene of so-and-so and so, I did what, uh, what you had in mind about it. You said, oh, he said, I hadn't thought of it that way, you mm -hmm. see. And uh, he's a great, uh, I thought Zanuck was the greatest studio head that I had ever seen for the simple reason because he said, that's your problem, you see. Mm -hmm. And he helps you in every way on earth and never interferes with anything. Mm -hmm. Never interferes with anything in the world. He wants to stimulate your imagination and for you to go right on, but he doesn't want you to throw all the money away. Yeah. He, he uh, inspires you to the point of you want to be economical with what you're doing. Mm -hmm. And in other words, uh, you, uh, you take, if you're going to reproduce this Taft building across the way here, mm -hmm. there are many ways to do it without building the Taft building, mm -hmm. you see. And uh, there's certain, you, what parts of it you're going to use, or how are you going to use it, or what. Uh, and uh, we, we'll say, uh, on a picture like David and Bathsheba, uh, Zanuck read the script, and he liked the script very much, and we had a conference. I mean, through the whole, we have a story conference of the mm -hmm. whole thing. All right, that finished it. Now, he ne Zanuck never went to a budget meeting in his life. Mm -hmm. He just stays away from it purposely, so that he has an opinion. Now, if he sat through a budget meeting and listened to uh, this department, but uh, then that department and the other department, you know how much your meeting is. Yeah. You, know, you have the transportation, you have the yeah. construction, you have everything there. You have probably 12 different departments in a tremendous big room, and each one of these people have their conception of how they're going to furnish you all the things you need in this. Mm -hmm. Well, Zanuck keeps away from that for the simple reason because if he, he, if he went there and became indoctrinated with all these things, he, he would have no way in the world, of, you know, of, but other than to go along with it. But by staying away from it, then he would say to me, he said, Henry, the budget on this picture is 400000 more than we have money to spend. Now, some way or another, you must get with the art department and the different departments and see how you can save for cut four hundred thousand dollars because I can't recommend to New York to put four hundred thousand dollars more in this picture than we have allotted to the making of it. Mm -hmm. All right, I go to the art department and uh, I begin to trim the sets and that how we can do this and how we can twist that and where we'll do this and instead of doing that here, let's do it on location. Mm -hmm. and uh, do build a little something on location and uh, mm -hmm. like uh, the hut where the sheep or herder was in we built that in daytime and put it on another little hill and, we're, uh, and uh, it, it wasn't much bigger than this room and put a couple of lights in it to illuminate it and shot it just at sundown mm -hmm. and uh, here you are in a biblical country and the house was actually there and lighted, you see. Mm -hmm. And well, those are things you have to know, the location, you have to know that. Well, you can't expect a man uh, sitting at a desk and running a studio to be able to find those things for you, but he has confidence and faith enough in you to know mm -hmm. that you are going to use the best judgment that you have and that you are going to do that and know how to use it when you get to it. Mm -hmm. And. Uh, well, then I get through with this department and that department, and we'll switch this, and we'll do that on location. We'll build a little of this, and how we'll do the big set of Jerusalem and all this. Uh, when we get through, we, we, we finish the picture, and we're 75000 under the budget. Mm -hmm. And uh, they say, there's 12 o'clock high. You take in 12 o'clock high. Uh, there have been two or three scripts written of 12 o'clock high, I was in Europe when this was done. 
I mean, when the script was written. Mm -hmm. And when I came back here, Zanuck says, I have saved this picture until you got back. He said, I have gone through three scripts with three different people, and I am fed up with it right up to here. And well, he says, I even right now, I'm not, uh, I have no ideas, I haven't anything in it, but I want you to take it and read it, and if you see in it a picture that you want to do, it's yours. Mm -hmm. All right, I read it, I went through it, and I said, you know, this can be made in a lot of things I disagree with in the script, but I said, uh, this can be made into a great picture. He said, I'm going to tell you what you do. He said, I want you to take Cy Bartlett, who was one of the writers, mm -hmm. I want you to take Cy Bartlett and get the hell way off from the studio. Mm -hmm. And you and Bartlett work the script out the way that you want it, then I want to read it. Mm -hmm. All right. Uh, I uh, took Bartlett, and, uh, and I was already now preparing. You see, to do it. So you put on the, immediately, I said, we're going to put on the schedule. And I took Bartlett to Eglin Field in Florida. And uh, when I got around to him, we started at 8 o'clock in the morning. And we worked until 12. We quit an hour for lunch. We spent 30 minutes just sitting and, and you know, and talking about something else. We went back to work, worked up till 7 o'clock. Then we had dinner and forgot about it. And we did that every day and for seven days. And on the... Uh, uh, the seventh day, while well, we worked till two o'clock in the morning to get the thing finished and get him out of there, he got he left and came back here to have it copied. But he got it copied, and and uh, I got back here and I went through it and uh, made a couple of notes. And Cy and I discussed a few little things and made a few little changes here, and then had it mimeographed and sent it down to Zanuck, and he read it. Says it's the best script I've ever read in my life. I mean, he's that uh, that flexible, that willing, and he he can he can see he can see more defects in the script than any man mm -hmm. I ever saw in my life. He's got the keenest eye for reading. He's got the keenest ear for listening of any man I've ever had been associated with. Yes, Donnelly Johnson said that Zanuck seemed to have a kind of radar that he would be reading a script, and suddenly you could almost hear his mind go tick 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 that something was wrong. I mean, you'd go back a page and say, that's where it goes wrong. That's exactly yeah. right. That's, yeah. that's the best description you would have. He has that radar. You did another one with Peck also, The Gunfighter. Yeah. Uh, and one of the most famous things about that is this mustache on Gregory Peck that Zanuck said lost him money. Was this mustache uh, put on Peck primarily to make the two characters in 12 o'clock high and the gunfighter look different because he had done the one right before? Well, you see, the fact of it was this. The, uh, uh, the, the Jimmy Ringo, that's how Jimmy Ringo looked. Mm. Did you ever read uh, uh, Pistol, I mean, uh, uh, that book has got all the gangsters in it, but you got uh, mm -hmm. uh, all of the gunmen in it. Uh, oh, I don't know. I can't think of them. Uh, but uh, I, I think it's a well, well known book. But anyway, mm -hmm. there's pictures of Jimmy Ringo in it. And uh, Nunley Johnson was definitely against him having a mustache because he thought that Zanuck wouldn't like it. Zanuck was when went to East or something, mm -hmm. I forgot what it was now. And I had Greg grow the mustache. Mm -hmm. And I had, went over to the barber shop and they gave him a haircut right straight around here, which mm -hmm. was exactly the haircut of the time of Ginny Ringo and mm -hmm. also and looking through this uh, <coughs> this book. Uh, it had all these pictures in it. And only through the book Nunley Johnson presented me with the book. Makes me so mad I can't think of the title of it, because you, know, you know it as well as, uh, yeah. as I do. Uh, he presented me with a book, and from the book I convinced him I should put the mustache on, mm -hmm. on Greg, and I cut his hair right around here. And his clothes and all like that. I, mm -hmm. I even had his coat. 
I had, I had the coat made on those split tails, you know, and the buttons in the back, and all that is made. And but he was still dubious because he was afraid Zanuck would not like this. And this was before shooting started. That you talked it over with Johnson about the oh, mustache. Oh yes, oh yes, this was before shooting started. And I had the mustache on. He was growing it, and Greg began to love the mustache. Well, anyway, the mustache got to a certain length. You see, and I told the makeup man, I said, now keep it right like that. Don't let it change that way at all. We went on location. We shot everything. We did the whole picture all the way down. And the the, the ending of the picture, no, the beginning of the picture, the saloon, the first room where they, where they met, was the last thing that I shot in the picture. I've been, you know, you never shoot anything in context yeah. in, in, in pictures, but I shot the beginning at the last. And I, it struck me, I said, that mustache is a little bit longer, it's a little longer than we've had it through the picture. And I just looked at the other rushes, well, the makeup man swore, Greg says it hasn't changed it exactly, and he loved the thing and all this, and all right, I put the picture together and ran it. And, uh, <coughs> ran it for Johnson and for uh, Zanuck, and uh, I knew Donnelly, I knew Donnelly was dubious as the devil with the mustache, mm -hmm. and we get in the projection room, and Zanuck doesn't say a word, he should say like this, he says, I would give $50,000 of my own money if I could get that mustache off of that guy. I thought Nanley Johnson was going to fall out of the chair. <laughs> he didn't say a word. I thought he, he said, well, uh, he, he not only, I think, wanted, probably he wanted to defend me, and yet he didn't know what to do. It, 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 it just took him completely. He was, not only was against the mustache to begin with, mm -hmm. he, he, for the simple reason that Zanuck was. Zanuck says this man has a young following. He has the young, the young girls, and all like this man. That mustache, I'm afraid he's going to kill it. And I, there, I said, well, you know, uh, what would you want me to do, uh, Darrell? Just change, take the uniform off and put the clothes on. Just change his clothes to change him from the general to the Jimmy Ringo. Mm -hmm. Oh. Bless you, Henry. He said, I'm not complaining about that at all. He said, this is a Remington. Remington couldn't have done it better than this. But I'm only thinking of box office appeal. Mm -hmm. I said, well, I'm only interested in making the pictures, and I want to make pictures that sell. And I believe that this picture will sell because it has interest. Mm -hmm. And I said, the thing that made us do it in the first place, I said, is not only said to me, one time, here's a story about one thing. A man that has been a bad man and trying to be a good man, nobody will let him. And I said, that's the story we told. And I said, it's not a story of a juvenile, it's not Tyrone Power's story, this is Jimmy Ringo. And I said, go and look, and uh, tri trigonometry. Trigonometry is the name of the book. I was driven to read it. No. You ought to read no, it. Trigonometry. Tri trigonometry. You ought to read it sometime. It's a well-known book. It's a good book. It's got all oh, Billy the Kid. Well, the Billy the Kid was a piker compared to Ringo. There's a minister's son that killed his 21st man on his 22nd birthday. Hmm. <laughs> I mean, and when you're dealing with that group of people, you see. So uh, the picture went out, and the reviews were tremendous. I mean, it was good reviews and did good business. It, uh, it didn't do as much as Peck's picture that he did called The Yellow Skies, mm -hmm. but it, uh, it did good business. Mm -hmm. And The Yellow Skies you never hear mentioned, and you hear uh, Gunfire mentioned, gun mentioned all the time. Yeah, did you have any idea when you were making it that it was going to get this, build this reputation over the years that it has as being one of the, the classic westerns. You, how can you do that? You can't do that. When you go it, when you go to do something, mm -hmm. it's like Babe Ruth. 
didn't know he was going to hit a home run every time he went to bat. Mm -hmm. He fanned out as many times as almost anyone, but he hit more home runs than anyone. Mm -hmm. But uh, he had a he had a, a great batting average. He had a, he had the best batting average of all of them. Mm -hmm. uh, you take a lot of the ball players. Every, every baseball player that goes to bat is up there to hit a home run. Mm -hmm. he, that's what he's hitting for. He's hitting over that fence. Mm -hmm. And every director that's worth a tinker's damn, every time he has a picture, he's trying to hit one over the fence. Mm -hmm. And uh, if you don't do the best you can, don't use all your facilities, use all your faculties, do everything to try to make this real Why you're not doing your job. Mm -hmm. And the money you get has no influence on what you kind of a picture you make. Mm -hmm. Because if you're a director, you can make just as good a picture for a dollar a year as you can for a half million dollars a picture. Mm -hmm. It just depends upon what you have here and how you use it.